Taking, taking it back to Zimride, so in 2006, I'm a senior in college, I'm taking a course called Green Cities uh, in the School of City Planning. Uh, and my professor gave this lecture about the history of transportation, and, and that's when that sparked that idea that, wow, the current system is incredibly inefficient. I started thinking about occupancy. And <clears throat> I started writing a business plan and a marketing plan for uh, an idea to make carpooling work. Uh, and at the time, I thought, carpooling sucks. I was like, it's the solution, but it sucks. Uh, and it sucks for, for three main reasons. One, how do you establish trust? If you're going to get in the car with someone else, like your parents told you not to do two things. You know, ride with strangers and take candy from strangers. And with Lyft, we, we do both. Uh, so, so we had to think a little differently. How do you get people to trust each other? Um, how do you uh, create a financial incentive? It wasn't enough to say, oh, carpooling is good for the environment, or it's you know, fun socially. You have to have a financial incentive. Uh, and the third was critical mass. And the two other things led to that critical mass. You need to just solve safety, you know, financial incentive, and then you, you could maybe start getting to the critical mass. Um, and the critical mass question is the hardest. It's this chicken or egg. A lot of marketplaces have things like this, but, but I'd say this is particularly strong. If you didn't have enough people doing carpooling, then why would I start doing it? Because I couldn't find a ride or I couldn't find a passenger. So uh, I started writing this business plan, marketing plan, and I still had that Greenwich bug of you need to get into finance. And so uh, uh, I went and worked at Lehman Brothers. And so this is 2006. And for those of you who know what happened to Lehman, Lehman Brothers, uh, it was still around in 2006. In fact, it had one of its best years ever. Um, and I signed up to do a two-year analyst program. And I told my best friend, I said, if, uh, if I don't leave here after two years, punch me in the face. Because I didn't, I didn't want to stay there. Um, <laughs> But I, I was worried because I had seen people that got sucked into that world, um, and I just didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know why people got so intoxicated with, with, with that world. And so uh, uh, about a year into it, I, I realized I didn't like it. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, motivating me. It wasn't super excited. I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot. Um, but I was on Facebook one night in 2007, and uh, my co-founder, who I didn't know at the time, Logan Green, posted on a mutual friend's Facebook wall, hey, check out this website I'm building, Zimride. And my last name is Zimmer, so this is really weird. Um, Logan had been to Zimbabwe, uh, where he had seen people sharing rides out of necessity. And he grew up in LA, where people sit in traffic out of necessity. Uh, and he thought, this is really stupid, and, and let me design a solution. He had an engineering product background. He started building uh, a website, Zimride.com, to get people to share rides on long distance carpools. Again, I'm online like not loving my job. Uh, and on Facebook and see a mutual friend starts a website that has part of my last name in it related to the topic that I've been obsessed about for the last few years. And I say, what the hell is going on here? And so I call the mutual friend. He, he connects Logan and I. Uh, and uh, and we, he, he said he was looking for a business partner. Um, he flew out to New York. We start working together. I work for another year at Lehman Brothers. Uh, and then I say, I'm going to leave. Uh, I've done my two-year analyst program. I'd seen half of my group. Uh, let go because Lehman was going like this and then it, my second year it started going like this. And a woman in my building who happened to be my best friend's mom said to me, how could you sh leave a sure thing like Lehman Brothers to do a crazy ass carpool startup? Uh, and when I, when I saw that, I think this is a thing about entrepreneurship is when you see these, you know, you have to be, you have to think differently. You have to think, you know, when you're told that you're, you're being, what your, your idea is never going to work. Um, Sometimes that, that's either going to be true or you're going to have the best idea ever because no one else thought of it. Right? And so it's part of being an entrepreneur is that you have to get comfortable and you have to almost like get fired up by that. I got fired up. She said, you know, how could you live a short thing like Lehman Brothers to do a crazy carpool startup? And I said, like, fuck it. Like, this is exactly why I don't want to be here. Uh, and, and I left pretty soon thereafter. Three months later, Lehman was bankrupt. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I sent her a note and said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Does she respond to that now? Yeah, she gets mad at me every time I bring it up. She says, you, you like, it's many years later, stop bringing it up. So yeah, she, she, she. Uh, I, love, I love that when such a situation happens, I'm like, those people that say you shouldn't do anything and yeah. you do it, and you prove them wrong, they yeah. should bear the rest of their lives, like every time you meet them. <laughs> they what, they're scared? Yeah, no, they should bear that story. Oh, oh, they should. The rest of their life, every yeah. time you meet them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it was, it was good for them to see. I mean, they, they're like this, uh, a lot of people, I think you know, a lot of New Yorkers uh, included, like that are just 
this stuck in the same way is now now New York is innovating. Right? Bloomberg came in and said, let's get let's set up this city for tech. Um, and so I think I think all, what often happens maybe out here in Silicon Valley ends up ends up spreading across the country. So anyway, I did leave. I, I zim road across the country. So I carpooled uh, out from the East Coast to the West Coast. ABC uh, followed us because it was a summer of high gas prices. Uh, and uh, we got to, uh, we had a crazy journey with a few friends. We got to Palo Alto. Uh, and I started living at my friend's parents' house. Um, and so after working at Lehman Brothers, having a high salary with big bonus um, around all my friends who like spent their bonuses, I always saved it. Um, uh, I went and lived at my friend's uh, parents' house. And uh, I did this for a few years. We took no salary, Logan and I, when we started Zimride. Zimride, for those of you who don't know, is, again, that long distance carpool as I'm leaving, leaving from college campus going home. Uh, and I didn't realize how weird it was that I was living at my friend's, parents' friend's house until I would have friends visit me. And eventually, uh, my girlfriend, who is now my wife, uh, and everyone was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you're living with, like, Quinn's mom. Like, this is really weird, man. <laughs> like, you go, down, you go downstairs, and, like, I, I would, like, go down, like, cook, cook in the kitchen, like, use their pots and pans. And, like, I just got so used to it. And then I would have friends that would give me the perspective, like, you're losing your mind. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's the beginning of the success story for Lyft, because that is probably your first experience with a shared economy. <laughs> I was like an Airbnb. Yeah. Yeah. And they charged me. My, my, my friend's mom charged me, and she charged her son, actually. What's that? She is a good entrepreneur, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so I uh, uh, was living there for a few years. I think it was probably three years. Six months of the three years, I lived in the office. We called it the apart fist. It was a half apartment, half office. Uh, Logan got the bedroom. And I had the second bedroom, which was turned into an office. And so I slept on the couch and then rolled over and went onto the computer. Um, but this was the first few years of, uh, of starting a company. Um, and so again, this was 2007. And we operated Zimride from 2007 to 2012. Uh, and, and the way that our business worked, we sold uh, networks to universities and companies. They would pay us an annual fee, and they would get a private network. So I went to Cornell. There would be a Cornell University. Zimride Network, if you went to Cornell, had a Cornell email address, kind of the way Facebook started. Um, and, uh, and the business, you know, it worked. We got to, uh, I remember saying at the beginning when I was living at my friend's parents' house, it's going to be really cool when we have 20 people working with us. And, and we got there. We had 25 people uh, working on the project. Uh, the business became profitable. We had 150 universities and companies paying uh, and raised a, a couple million dollars. Um, and, and Logan and I look at each other uh, in the middle of 2012, and, and we went back to our vision again. And we said, you know, we want to reconnect people and communities through better transportation. And, and we had also said we want to change the fact that 80% of seats are empty at all times. And so we looked at ourselves and said, how are we doing uh, towards the, that vision? And we said, we're not doing enough. Right? We're getting college kids to, to use this for trips maybe twice a year, um, but that's not going to have a big enough impact. And so this is, I think, another important lesson, which is you know, sometimes you have to reinvent yourself through the process or reinvent your product through the process and kind of ask uh, the hard question of, forget all that. You know, we had 25 people working on this. We had built up all this technology. We had 150 clients. Like, money was coming in. We had told investors this is what we were doing. But we had to say, like, wait, stop. If we were starting over, like, forget all that baggage. What would this look like? So now you have iOS and Android, which didn't exist when we started. Uh, you've seen you know, other companies come about that are doing interesting things in transportation. Uh, and we said, well, what would we do today? Um, we, would, we would make this work for uh, everyday trips. So instead of trips that you would take twice a year from college, we want these to be trips you would take twice, twice a day. We want to replace, we want to create an alternative to car ownership. Um, and at the time, Uber existed doing black cars. Uh, and to us, that was like, Everyone's private driver. That's great. You know, some people will want that. Uh, but to be the alternative to car ownership that makes it such that you don't need a car ever, you know, we're going to have to come to create an affordable product, but also a brand and experience that I would argue is more human. 
uh, where people, where drivers treat passengers well and, and, and passengers pe treat drivers well. And this is, you know, I think from my background in hospitality, I wanted to create the right experience that would scale, uh, become mainstream, uh, that would allow anyone to be a driver. All of us should be Lyft drivers is the, is the idea into the future. And so this is the middle of 2012, uh, and the idea is to use personal vehicles uh, to uh, get people to provide rides to others for a fee. This is like, it's never been done uh, with personal vehicles. And there are major legal questions. Many would argue it was 100% illegal. Um, and so this is another turning point for us as, as entrepreneurs uh, and, and for the business. And we had a business that was working. And we said, let's do this thing that we, we think will help us get farther along with our vision, uh, but is you know, completely different and fraught with regulatory risk. And we said, fuck it, let's go for it. Um, and actually, like to the, to the um, uh, credit of our general counsel, usually lawyers are not you know, lenient, but we, we were in a board meeting and our, our now general counsel said, oftentimes some of the, the biggest businesses are started when, uh, when there is this type of challenge, when, because people haven't done it before. And so we did it. Two months later, we got a cease and desist from uh, the state of California telling us to stop. Uh, uh, we, I, call, I called Arnold Schwarzenegger's chief of staff, who, his former chief of staff, he was no longer governor, uh, and she was phenomenally helpful in advising on government relations. Uh, we, we had already created a more safe system for sharing rides than uh, any, any taxi or limo uh, that we had seen before. So we had criminal background checks, driving record checks. Uh, we had uh, you know, created that experience of hopping in the front seat, you know, getting to know your driver. Um, we had onboarded, you know, hundreds of drivers. Um, and so uh, we fought back, and we fought back with the community. And we fought back with the vision. You know, we, it wasn't just the vision that we had, but it was the vision that our drivers had and our passengers had uh, for a better way of getting around cities. Uh, and we were eventually able to push back uh, against all the, the, the legal and regulatory hurdles we had. We created new rules in California uh, that have now been spread across uh, about 30 states now. Um, and so uh, that's just one of the, the hardest times and trying times. They told us they were going to come to our office. They were threatening to uh, arrest drivers, impound vehicles, go after us. Um, and, and we just went back to our vision and said, you know, the net, po the net of what we're doing is very positive, is worth fighting for, um, and, and we're going to keep, keep driving through it.